Greetings from Castle Goring, from Mickey, Aurora, and from me. Well, 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 much excitement, much drama. Bongo, bongo drums have been going. And unfortunately, I thought I was going to have a real juicy scoop for you. But then I got preempted because but after I found out something on Monday, I was trumped. So anyway, we'll get to that in a minute. But first of all, I want to say, I went to an absolutely wonderful musical the other evening at 194 Piccadilly in London called Rehab the Musical. It was so good that I agreed that I would read out something that they can also use on their publicity. So <laughs> I this is what I have to say about Rehab the Musical. A very funny musical about a very serious issue. Rehab the Musical deals with the subject of addiction and mental health with warmth, humor and heart written by people who understand it from the inside out. Darkly comic, but with deeply sympathetic characters, Rehab the Musical takes its audience on an emotional, thought-provoking journey that's nothing less than a social statement on addiction and the devastating impact it has on people of all ages, genders and backgrounds. It rarely, I have to tell you, was everything entertainment should be. It was thought provoking, it was moving, the music was good, the acting was superb, well staged, well presented, really good performances. As close to perfect entertainment as it is possible to get. So anybody who's interested, Rehab the Musical 194 Piccadilly, really worth seeing. And now we are going to move on to those who should be in rehab. <laughs> Ek two says, oh my, and this, I have to tell you, I'm sure you realize is one of many. Oh my goodness, Lady C, I know you'll get hundreds of messages about this, but the gruesome twosome supposedly made a surprise appearance at the premiere of the new biopic Bob Marley, One Love, at the Carried Fives Theatre in Kingston, Jamaica. All I know is that your upcoming broadcast about this is going to be spicy. <laughs> Those were the bongo bongo drums that I was getting from Monday. But anyway, this was even before they appeared at Carried Theatre. Your insights are always fun and enlightening. Sp please spill the tea, Lady C. Thank you. And I'm going to read out another one because, or in fact, another two, and then I'm going to answer everything as one. Hello, Lady C. This is from Sandra Chevalier. Would you please give us your personal intel on the Meg Ha? <laughs> duo's appearance at the Bob Marley movie premiere in Jamaica. Thanks in advance. Love your videos. Never missed one since June 2020. Big kisses to your fur babies. And Darlene Chandler says, the media today said H&M were in Jamaica at the Bob Marley Bob, sorry, <laughs> Bob Marley, sorry, movie opening and went there Tuesday to attend. Well, they didn't go on Tuesday to attend. 
they were at the Half Moon Hotel going from the beach to the new section of the hotel called the Eclipse at Half Moon because Half Moon is a very old resort, very smart hotel. Princess Soraya of Iran stayed there in 1973. I remember it very well. She came to dinner at Sarah Spencer Churchill's house and we went and had drinks with her at the Half Moon Hotel. So it's always been very chic and Harry and Meghan were there because a friend of mine saw them and phoned me. Bongo, bongo clubs were beating between Jamaica and London. Well, actually it was London. <laughs> I was in London at the time. Uh, so it wasn't here, it was London. But she saw them on Monday. So they were not in Jamaica on Tues from Tuesday. They were in Jamaica from Monday. And they were being trailed by a photographer. So I dare say it's only a matter of time before we have photographs of them from Backgrid or one of their favorite photographers. What's his name? Baal Carson. Oh, and oh, some other name. Oh, there's another one whose name escapes me at the moment deliberately on purpose. And mm, according to this friend of mine, he had the most dreadful scowl on his face and looked totally miserable and she was obviously enjoying every moment of it all and she actually spoke to them she went out of her way to speak to them now i don't think she knew who they were but in fact they are well their first cousin is my first cousin's first cousin <laughs> very interconnected sorry and their father was extremely eminent and i cannot say who he was and what his rank was otherwise it gives the game away and this particular sister her surname is the surname of a very famous american banking family into which she married and <laughs> she was really concerned for him, I've got to tell you. So anyway, that's the Monday. Now, of course, they flew in on Megan's broomstick. Uh, no, they didn't. Didn't they fly in on economy? I think they did. <laughs> you believe me, don't you? Of course they didn't. Well, can you imagine, as she said, Harry, who's supposed to hate publicity, everywhere they now go, obviously, they have a personal photographer trailing them. I mean, you really do have to have some pity for him. Yes, he's he made his bed and he's certainly being made to lie in it. Rock, stone and all, as they would say in Jamaica. Well, they were in Jamaica for the premiere of the Bob Marley One Love Bayou film. Uh, which has the backing of Bob Marley's family and his estate. It's got a very good cast and a, one of the executive producers incidentally is Brad Pitt. Rita Marley, Bob's widow, 
is also involved, as are her children with Bob. Sidella, named after Bob's mother, and I'll come to that in a little while because I knew his mother, and Ziggy, their son, who is quite a well-known entertainer now. All three of them are producers. James Norton plays a distant cousin of mine called Chris Blackwell. Chris is the one who, with Dickie Johnson, a childhood friend of mine, uh, with his brother and sister. His sister, Dan, incidentally, was one of Bob's queens and was Bob's and most likely is still the estate's lawyer. The Jobsons are a very, very eminent plantocratic Jamaican family. And Chris and Dickie started Ireland Records, and Chris is in the movie uh, played by James Norton, the rather dishy James Norton. And I gather it's a really good movie and worth watching. So for what that's worth. Now, let's come on to sort of the more personal bits involved. It was premiered at the Carib Theatre, and I'm just going to give you one or two of the, uh, since so many people know I'm Jamaican, and it really was everywhere I spun, it was evocative of my childhood or past, because it was premiered at the Carib Theatre, which is, has been titivated beautifully. Well, my father was one of the major shareholders in Palace Amusements, which owned, and I gather still owns, Carib Theatre. <laughs> and that sort of rang a lot of bells for me because this will mean nothing to anybody except Jamaicans, but I've got to insert it. Mitzi Siaga, whose husband Eddie was the Prime Minister of Jamaica. She was Miss Jamaica in, I think, 1961 or something. And she was Mitzi Constantine. And her mother used to man one of the tills, the central till at Carib Theatre. And Mrs. Constantine was a lovely, lovely lady. She was... If I remember correctly, I'm going back to before 1963, incidentally. Uh, she used to go to Kingston Parish Church, which my grandfather was one of the leading lights of. And my grandfather's one who was murdered in 1963. And sometimes Grandpa, when he took us to church, would drop Mrs. Constantine home. So it was... I had all these memories going all the way back because it's thanks to people like Eddie Siaga and Chris Blackwell that Jamaican heritage has been preserved. Also, Eddie Siaga was the head of the Jamaica Labour Party, which is like the Republican Party in America or the Conservatives in England, although it's far more centrist than either of those, although we're pretty centrist in England, I've got to tell you. The Tory party, party is very labour light, and meaning a version of the Labour Party, which is our alternative major party. But... Eddie was the Prime Minister, and incidentally, Eddie's parents I called Uncle Philip and Aunt Babs, and he called my father Uncle Mike, what they all called my mother Gloria, because she was their age. And, and uh, the present Prime Minister of Jamaica, Andrew Holness, who went to school with my brother Mickey, Ironically enough, if I remember correctly, I think he did. Uh, but I think he was a bit younger than us. 
uh, but he is the present head of the party and the present prime minister of Jamaica. So it's all pretty interwoven. And uh, where I'm concerned, it's pretty much, it's really my world because uh, a few months ago, a, friend, a cousin of mine called Turo Zadie, he died and was given a massive send off, a sort of semi-state funeral. Uh, he was one of the leading lights in the Jamaica Labour Party and he was a senator and blah, blah, blah. And in fact, when Andrew Holness was running for office, I was asked to do a broadcast to encourage people to vote for him, which is still there on my website or whatever you'd call it. And I did, it was about a minute or two minutes, so anyway, it was very short. So <laughs> you could say I did my little bit to help to hopefully get Andrew Holness elected as Prime Minister of Jamaica. So I just tell you all of that so that our <laughs> Because, of course, I can't say to whom I've been speaking or particularly who said what to me. But I will say I have a lot of connections going back in, in time to the Marley family because Bob Marley was the illegitimate son of a white Jamaican and a black Jamaican. And unusually, I think she was about 40 years younger than he was. And they, they started their romance when she was, I think, 16. And I think she was 19 when Bob was born. I know all of this because my cousin, Anthony C. Winkler, who was my father's nephew, he's a very well-known writer in that part of the world. He wrote Sidella. Booker, Sidella Marley Booker, who was Bob's mother's autobiography. And indeed, when they launched it in London, I gave a, a dinner party and a drinks party in their honour at my house on Bourne Street. This would have been, I don't remember now, <laughs> 20 years ago. I don't remember. Anyway, a long enough time ago. And... He married her, which was really unusual for an upper-class white Jamaican to marry uh, an ordinary black woman was very unusual. And, of course, I grew up with the Marley family. Uh, in fact, Beryl Marley, was, who was uh, the cousin, uh, she was married to Bob's father's cousin. Uh, she wanted to introduce me to one of her sons. Uh, and I remember her saying to me, which was one of the most, I think, important things anybody ever said to me. I was 23, I think, or 22. And she said to me, she said, you know, Georgie, everybody goes on and on about how good looking you are. She said, but the really unusual thing about you is your personality. <laughs> she said, along the lines of cherish that and don't focus on the other. And I thought, mm. so anyway, the Marlies and we all go back a long, long way. Let's put it that way. And, and uh, my brother Mickey also was Bob's lawyer in England and and in fact my brother Mickey dead and gone now he organized with Diane Jobson Dan organized it in Jamaica and my brother Mickey organized it in England for Bob to go to that clinic in Germany where he was they were hoping against hope he would be cured or if not cured at least he lasts longer because he had melanoma and it started in his big toe and he fatally 
or listen to one of his acolytes who said, Lord Bob, you can't make a doctor chop off your big toe. You ever hear about a rock star without a big toe? Fatal. And he died, literally. So it really was fatal. And and uh, then after Bob died, so gratis Diane, my brother and his law firm is the one that handled the the estate because it was very complicated because Bob had his widow, Rita. He never divorced Rita. Uh, he had children with Rita while he was also having children with my childhood friend, Cindy Briggs Spare. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I'm going to tell you all of these connections because it's just so bizarre that uh, every, everybody is so interconnected. And then I'm going to get on to Harry and Meghan and their naughtiness. But anyway, uh, and because Cindy, who was... Uh, She's very beautiful, still is. Uh, she and Bo she, Bob was one of, she was one of Bob's queens. And Diane Jobson was another one of his queens for a while. But they also, she was his very trusted lawyer. And I don't really remember the ins and outs, but I remember it was a huge case that it trundled through to the House of Lords because there were all of these children and everybody needed to be satisfied and they they needed to divide up the estate, which was pretty substantial in the 80s, but is now even larger because Bob Marley has become far more, his estate has become far richer as he has gone on in time. I mean, I remember in Moscow, uh, outside of the Kremlin in 1992, 1992, right, 1991, uh, with some, some, a tourist or a Russian, I don't really know who it was, had a ghetto blaster. I don't know if you guys remember the ghetto blasters about this size, by this size, by this size. He had this huge ghetto blaster. No woman, no cry. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I thought, gosh, Bob Marley's got everywhere. Anyway, it's a very substantial and in, in Jamaican terms, a very important movie. And I think it's also important to Paramount Pictures. They had their CEO, Brian Robbins, there with his wife, uh, Tracy James, who's a stylist. And uh, he's not only the CEO of Paramount Pictures, but he's the president of Nickelodeon. And then I understand that uh, Megan was very eager to be photographed with them. And Andrew Holness and his wife were obviously photographed with Harry and Megan. He's the Prime Minister of Jamaica. Now, where the trouble really starts is, and now we take the gloves off and we go in for, shall we say, the nitty gritty. First of all, the comment was made to me that she was several shades darker than she normally is. And this time she wasn't only, she didn't only bronze up or as, one of the Jamaicans has said to me, Labrish time, my dear. I tell you, you see, it was absolutely amazing if you had ever seen Megan. She brown up to, and then said something which I can't say on, but to RC. 
<laughs> Jamaican spend the what I'm saying. And what so so Megan was very subtly emphasizing her African heritage. Well, maybe not so subtly because several people commented on how how fake tanned she was. Which, I mean, at least as I said to one of my friends, I said, well, at least this time she didn't only brown up the face and leave the white neck and the white arms. She's browned up everywhere. So, which is good. Which is good. At least it shows consistency. And, you know, people are have very... They're very upset about the fact that Meghan and Harry were there at all because Meghan and Harry were the president and the vice president of the Queen's Commonwealth Trust and couldn't do anything of any consequence except race bait and cause nothing but trouble within the Commonwealth, chief of which was in Jamaica. Now, I have covered in a previous video following the visit of William and Catherine in the Queen's Jubilee year where there was this huge cock up with thanks to Meghan and Harry's race baiting, Meghan's especially, where there were problems in Belize and there were problems in Jamaica. And it ruined William and Catherine's visit. And it bounced Andrew Holness into a very awkward position. Now, obviously, if I helped to get the man elected, I am a supporter of his. Having said that, I do understand how the difficulties that he was placed in, not only because of Meghan's race baiting, but Lisa Hanna, who is the number two in the opposition party, which is, would be the equivalent of the Labour Party in this country. But the leader of the opposition party is white and Lisa Hanna is brown. And Lisa Hanna was busy manipulating the whole race situation for to really try to knock the leader of her party out so that she can play the color card and he will be at a disadvantage because he's white. And, and she was using all of this. And this was the backstory and the subtext to what was going on with William and Catherine's visit, all of which emanated from Meghan's race-baiting claims to Oprah. Well, they have appeared in Jamaica, the, but, and they were photographed with Andrew Holness and his wife, and it was just a photograph, and as is to be expected but you know the reality is they weren't asked because Meghan was a star of suits first of all Meghan wasn't a star of suits Meghan was number six on the call sheet Gina Torres was the star of suits if they were gonna ask somebody because of her color and her success as an actress they wouldn't have been asking number six on the call sheet. They would have been asking number one on the call sheet. So Megan wasn't asked because she was a woman of color and a star of suits. She wasn't asked because of that. Harry is the one. And ironically enough, I can see, having spoken to a whole load of people about this, because people are up in arms about it. And not only in England, but in Jamaica. And people are horrified that 
Harry and Meghan could and you could you notice she she was she was too good a mother to go to the Living Legends Award uh, because one of the children was ill. I'm not getting my close up. You're not getting my presence. And you make sure that you put that John Travolta in his place, dying out on you, on mom's memory. Who does he think he is just because he thinks he's a star? He's not a star. Saturday Night Fever, Grease, what's all of that about to be? He's not a star of suits. Well, the fact of the matter is that I had come to the conclusion, having spoken to an awful lot of people, and this is going to surprise a lot of people when I say this, Harry is the one who was asked because he is a member of the royal family and Meghan came along and it plays very well in countries of colour that he's married to a mixed race a woman and that of course was one of the Queen's plans for Harry and Meghan within the Queen's Commonwealth Trust that all of this would work to the advantage of the Commonwealth and foster racial inclusivity, instead of which Meghan and Harry decided they were going to foster racial divisiveness. However, where the average Jamaican is concerned, they're not that interested, and this is my opinion, having spoken to a lot of people, they are not that interested in the nuances. As far as they're concerned, Harry is a member of the British royal family. Harry was very popular in Jamaica. In 2012, when he went, everybody loved him. He was personable. He was good fun. He wasn't the sourpuss, uh, scowling, oh, mm sort of creature that he has become and everybody loved him and people remember that and also they as far as they're concerned it's a member of the royal family who's come to bob's premiere that's all they care about and in a funny sort of way it's not going to be racially divisive. If anything, Meghan's little bit of blood of colour is going to work in favour. Now, insofar as Jamaica's desire to possibly be a republic is concerned, yes, Andrew Holness was bounced by the whole mischievousness of the Oprah interview and the consequences thereof on the state visit of William and Catherine to distance himself from anything that would seem to be on black. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And he did. But basically, what people don't understand, except in places like Jamaica, whether Jamaica is a republic or a monarchy, it's going to remain a part of the Commonwealth. And as long as Jamaica keeps on remembering its national motto, which is out of many, one people. We were the creators of racial inclusivity in the world. I mean, I don't understand how Jamaicans don't beat that drum more. It's thanks to little Jamaica that 
racial inclusivity. We were at the forefront of the movement of racial inclusivity in the 1950s, at a time that segregation was practiced in the southern states of the United States of America. And the reality is, whether we are a republic or a monarchy, as long as we embrace our heritage, which by and large has been pretty positive, not always, but pretty positive, we will be fine as a country as long as we don't go down the race-baiting route, which Michael Manley started us down, and Meghan Markle has triggered off again. So, I hope that sort of clarifies to an extent. People are very upset that Harry and Meghan were there at all. Uh, because they see, why are Harry and Meghan there? I mean, what do they have to do with Bob Marley? Because she passed for white for most of her life. And she certainly passes, in my opinion, for the most supreme elitist. And whatever Bob Marley's failings, he certainly was not an elitist. He was all in favor of racial inclusivity and societal harmony. Megan has not shown that she is of either of those. So people are asking, why are they there? And then the answer is because Harry is a, is a royal. So it's a royal visit. <laughs> it's unbelievable, the whole thing. So Without further ado, I will now wrap this up by answering one or two particular questions. Curling Jan says, Lady C, are you able to comment on Sperry Markle and his stardust wife attending the Bob Marley One Love premiere? I'm particularly interested in what is the purpose of being photographed with the Prime Minister, who just so happens to be anti-monarchy. Best wishes to you, Lady C. Well, Andrew Holness is a politician, and politicians want to be number one, unless they are truly nobly self-sacrificing, and it doesn't usually go along with the job specifications, sorry. Also, it would not be that popular for Andrew Holness to say that he was pro-monarchy because he is a centrist and he has a rabidly left-wing opposition who have played the colour and class cards since 1972 gratis Michael Manley. To an extent, no matter what Andrew Holness might privately feel, he is almost obliged to take the view that if, in terms of his political posture that Jamaica should be a republic. So I hope that answers the question because, you know, when one is dealing with real situations, one needs to understand the nuances and why people sometimes do things that may not be quite so obvious. And there is, uh, there is a strong feeling amongst many people in Jamaica that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. While there are others who think, well, you know, black man day come, white man day pass. Time to have a president. I don't see why we should be having a prime minister when we can have a president. What they don't realise is that it will alter the legal structure of Jamaica. So ultimately, it's, and that's the big worry, because ultimately the 
judiciary in the West Indies might turn out to be a little bit more, shall we say, questionable than the judiciary in England are. I mentioned earlier that my brother's law firm and my brother nursed the Bob Marley estate case through to the House of Lords. Well, it's now this, I think now the Supreme Court that deals with it. They changed the names. But there was the view then, and there is still the view now, that top British judges are definitely going to be a lot less influenced by local prejudices, trends, traits, and possibilities than West Indians would be. So that's a good reason for keeping Jamaica a monarchy. But personally, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me whether Jamaica is a monarchy or a republic. And I don't think it matters to most Jamaicans because we will still be in the Commonwealth. So it's really a non-argument. And ironically enough, the royal family understands this better than the average person. Interesting, isn't that? Patty Gunn says, comments picked up from another table at the Aviators Award, as mentioned in Quora. Harry and Meghan are not living together. Well, Patty Gunn, let me tell you something. As I said, they were seen by my friend at Half Moon, walking from the beach up to the clubhouse at eclipse and he was scowling and looked miserable and dejected and unhappy and she was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. So are they living together or not? My own take on it is that it does not behoove us to listen to closely to gossip because I think that they are very well suited in many ways because they are two peas of one pod in one pod. They are bound by their failings, not that easy to escape from them, especially when his children are involved. Wife in the bin says, Morning Lady C. So, ill child didn't stop both parents flying off to Jamaica then. Are they ever going to learn that the world sees right through their lies? No, they're never going to learn. People like that don't learn. That's one of the definitions of the various disorders that they, their conduct leads me to believe they exhibit. People like that don't learn. They are as transparent as glass. I used to say to my mother, you are as transparent as freshly cleaned glass. I don't think she actually understood what I was talking about. People like that think they're so clever. And they're so able to hoodwink everybody. Well, Harry and Meghan are an exhibition in dupes who think they're duping us, but they're only duping themselves and each other. Clodagh Nye Gallagher says, Dear Lady C, I hope you and the girls are well. Todger and the diabolical Duchess appeared in Jamaica at the premiere of a Bob Marley biopic. They were photographed with the Prime Minister of Jamaica. Do you think this was another way of undermining King Charles and the monarchy, given that Jamaica wants to separate from the monarchy in the way Barbados has? Also, it appears they are now attempting to broker themselves to Nickelodeon. My observation is that the opportunities offered by William Morris Endeavour are becoming increasingly less prestigious. I would love to hear your thoughts, Clodagh. Well, yeah. Mm. 
I don't think Harry and Meghan care whether they undermine the monarchy or not. I suspect with both of them, it would be an incidental payoff and delight if they could poison the pond of bigger fish than them. I detect spiteful elements to their conduct that lead me to believe that they would actually, not secretly, but absolutely delighted if they could damage the monarchy. However, I don't think either of them thinks they will actually destroy the monarchy. And I think the long-term view now is shaping up that Harry and Meghan are not going to destroy the monarchy, that Harry and Meghan are simply going to destroy themselves. So, will they be attempting to broker themselves to Nickelodeon? Well, William Morris uh, Endeavour hasn't come up with anything, has it, so far? Nothing of any consequence. Nickelodeon is not going to be able to turn nickel into platinum. Let's put it that way. So they can broker themselves to anybody unless they have personality changes. It's, in my opinion, an ever diminishing level of prestige for both of them. People will simply be able to get them for less unless because don't think that they went to Jamaica without incentives and also don't think that the incentives are what they would have been three years ago and or four years ago let's leave it at that for the moment so Corinne Lavinia says that picture with the Prime Minister of Jamaica does seem to confirm the Montecitos duos labels as traitors to the monarchy. Well, yes, you might think so. And I'm sure they are indifferent to the monarchy. And I'm sure they are indifferent to the, any, po any effect, negative or positive, they would have upon the monarchy. I'm sure of their conduct that their only concern is the advantage that will accrue to them. If people wish to regard them as traitors, I would be the last person to try to discourage them from doing so. People are entitled to their opinion and when it's based upon the conduct of the people they are assessing, I say go right ahead and assess. Magma says, there is footage of Harry clearly upset at the table he was assigned. This is at the Living Legends Awards. And it is easy to see that he is saying, I'm expected to sit here. I suspect he was angered by his assigned seat and acted out at the podium. Quite possible. Quite possible. He was certainly, definitely off his demeanour, upset about something. And we can speculate till the cows come home as to what his true motives were. I suspect they were a combination of factors. Megan not being there because somebody was sick. I'm so, Mr. Demille, I'm so sick, can you believe it? I'm just sick to the bones that I'm not going to be able to dance with John Travolta. I'm so sick, I'm going to have to stay home and take care of one of my babies. You know, those babies that I elephant-like carried for 18 months apiece. I mean, look at it, it ruined my figure. Look at my figure now, Mr. DeMille. Look at it. Oh, isn't it fabulous? Oh, I'm so, I'm just so fabulous. And I'm 
but I'm a wanderer of nature, Mr. Demilicals. Can you imagine? I carried those two Al Al no, 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 not albatrosses, babies, for 18 months each, and right back to the old figure I used to have. <gasps> yes, Mr. DeMille. Mm. Then, Bella Bell says, as far as I know, Diana asked for Travolta to be there as she was a fan of his. Travolta was equally as famous as Diana and for longer. I would say that it was Diana who dined out on her dance with him. And I'm going to read out a few of these because I think they're really interesting. And we need to place things in their proper context. And I am delighted when members of our community write in with information that it behooves me to impart on their behalf to everyone else. Shirley MacLean's, MacLean says... Paul Burroughs stated in his book that when choosing which dresses to go to auction, Diana suggested the beautiful Victor Edelstein evening gown. Paul asked if she was sure, as that was the dress she was wearing when she danced with Travolta at the White House. Diana said that it must be donated because it would only remind her of the night she didn't dance with Mikhail Baryshnikov, confirming rumours that the Russian ballet dancer had politely declined her invitation to dance. Travolta was a substitute for Baryshnikov. When you wrote this, it triggered memories. And Elgin says, anyone feeling sorry for has should watch the John Travolta interaction, pure unwanted arrogance and spite and jtn says the worst comment was you can go now that was the epitome of bad manners b carol says yes she had M M mikhail barishnikov at her table and he passed her his menu for her to autograph it she was so disappointed he could not dance she loved ballet she did she wanted to be a dancer. She told, she told Sam and Barry, I'd like to be a dancer or the Princess of Wales. Those were her two career choices. This was before she really knew Charles in an adult way. She would indeed be disgusted with Harry. In fact, he probably never would have married Meghan because Diana would have warned him of her. She was good at reading people's motives, the users. She had to dodge them herself. And we're going to end with Tintern Abbess, who says, Harry was so rude, John Travolta did not deserve that. However, the actual story of the White House dance was a bit different. Diana wanted to dance with Mikhail Baryshnikov that night. In fact, she requested he be seated at her table, which he was. She was crestfallen when she discovered that he had had an orthoscopic knee surgery in August of that year, 1985, and was unable to dance. She rather pouted. Nancy Reagan arranged for John Travolta to ask her. She also danced with Clint Eastwood, Neil Diamond, Tom Selleck and President Reagan. Over the years, John Travolta has told the story many times, yes, but in a reverential way. Prince Harry has such a rude and ungracious edge, and what he said of John Travolta was mean-spirited, not just some folksy banter. I just detest what Harry has become and what he has done. In the words of Shakespeare via King Lear, how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child. Diana, were she alive, would be mortified and would very much disapprove of Harry's behaviour and the grifting, grasping Markle. Well, remember who is at her side. And on that note, I'm going to say, I think at the end of the day, we will discover that 
Harry and Meghan's presence in Jamaica will have done nothing more than bring to everybody's attention Bob Marley won Love the Movie, which was the object of the exercise. Publicity, publicity, publicity. Nobody, either at Paramount or in Montecito, cared one bit whether it would ultimately affect Jamaica as a nation state adversely or positively. As far as they were concerned, it doesn't matter. It's all about the publicity. And shall I tell you something? Harry and Meghan are all about publicity as well. He, glow, he goes along with it. He colludes with her. Whether he likes it or not and does it voluntarily or not, he does it. He's therefore responsible. More than that, I don't think I need to say, and I hope this has been of some interest to you and you have not minded me meandering all about the place down memory lane and elsewhere. Okay, thank you so much. God bless and goodbye. And if you have enjoyed this, please remember to like, share, subscribe, press the notification bell and keep the questions and comments coming in so I will know what you would like us to be speaking about. Okie dokes. Bye-bye.